kickoff event. <laughs> West Valley College supports aspiring entrepreneurs in their efforts to start and grow successful ventures that foster the sustained vitality and success of today's local and global economy. Not only does West Valley College offer an array of state-approved transfer courses and certificates in entrepreneurship, we also host an entrepreneur in residence, offer guidance and mentoring through our entrepreneurship center, and provide ongoing presentations from entrepreneurial experts. I like to think of our entrepreneurship programs as one of our signature programs at the college, and I'm personally so very proud and honored to be part of this and support the good work from our faculty and staff on this endeavor. Since some entrepreneurs have indicated that starting a business can be a solitary pursuit, West Valley College's entrepreneurship programs ensure that inspiring entrepreneurs can benefit from connecting and networking with other like-minded individuals in a supportive and productive environment. In support of your efforts to define and refine your business models, West Valley College brings you tonight's Startup Cup kickoff event. I would like to introduce Alice Fenton, the organizer of the Silicon Valley Startup Cup. Alice is a former owner of several businesses and is passionate about the grassroots development of local and global enterprises. Please join me and give a big West Valley welcome to Alice Fenton. begin this evening by acknowledging one of our Startup Cup, uh, one of the members of our Startup Cup team. Many of you knew Charlie Ross, but some of you may not have known that Charlie died suddenly at the beginning of this year. He was an incredible support to us. He worked with entrepreneurs before they went into their judging sessions. He interviewed them and made them feel I've really got something going here, and he gave them encouragement and support throughout the process. So I just want to acknowledge him and say how grateful we were to have him a part of our program. Diane Ross, his wife is here. She is part of our team. She is our photographer, videographer, and we are so glad that she is continuing to work with us. So what I'd like to do is present Diane with an azalea from our Startup Cup team as a way to remember the incredible work that Charlie did for us. So now I just want to welcome our sponsors. We have uh, Dick Conniff for Focus Business Bank. Of course, West Valley College, of course. I've worked closely with Heidi in pulling together the uh, programs that we do here. And Mary West Credit Union. So it's important to thank our sponsors because without them, this program would not be as viable as it is today. I also want to thank our judges and coaches. Can you raise your hand if you're a judge and a coach? Because people, the rest of you want to look for them during the your business model plan. So now we come to the middle part of our program, which is Sean Griffin. I have known Sean, it seems impossible to say this, for over 20 years. We've worked together in businesses, we've founded business, businesses, we've written books together, and it is just a pleasure to be able to work with such a forward thinker and someone who's on the cutting edge of all that's going on. He's very interested in community, has been from the first time I met him. He's a graphic facilitator. But one of the things that impressed me most when I first met him was his ability to get up in front of a group, capture ideas on a 16-foot wall of paper in beautiful colors and symbols and, 
and uh, just really listening and capturing uh, the ideas that we talked about. So that impressed me about him. Since uh, he has become uh, an entrepreneur, he became that way back uh, when he was just a kid. When he founded his own business, how old were you, Sean? I'm like eight or nine, 12. Oh. And he's been a serial entrepreneur ever since. And in that role, he's learned to work with, with entrepreneurs all over this country and now at this point in time all over the world. So what I would like for you to see is a, a short video of how far Startup Cup has come since it was launched in the end of 2011, beginning of 2012. This is when Sean asked me if I would be the organizer of what was then, two years ago, the Santa Clara County Startup Cup. It has evolved into the Silicon Valley Startup Cup. And I said, when he asked me to do that, I said, well, sure. Not really understanding how many experiences and opportunities I've had in the process. So thank you. I've enjoyed, I've enjoyed the journey and will continue to do so. So let's watch this two-minute video. It'll show you what has happened since the inception of Startup Cup.
So, but I forgot to tell you earlier is that Sean has come here to be with us after visiting Laos and Cambodia, flying through Tokyo and into San Jose on Monday, and is here tonight as part of his global entrepreneur experience. So, Sean, it's my pleasure. Thank you very much, Alice. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna see if we get this work one more time here for us. Perfect. So what I'm gonna do here is a little presentation. Oh. One thing though about becoming serial entrepreneur and getting older, can't see. Okay, I'm gonna step down here. So, one of the things that's exciting about Startup Cup and one of the reasons we were showing you the video is that we're really part of a global network. So Startup Cup is, is growing. Today we had 73 Startup Cups. You saw 68 up there. Uh, Kazakhstan signed up today. So we're in 61 countries, which is kind of amazing. And we're, what we're really working to do is make sure we're interconnecting and working towards connecting all the entrepreneurs and all the different uh, service providers around the world uh, so that we can start having increased collaboration on a global level. So that's one of our activities this year. Uh, in particular, though, it's always good to be back home. So this is a college that I, that I went to uh, in my younger days, and also where I cut my teeth on entrepreneurship is in Silicon Valley. And all the methodologies that uh, I'm going to share with you here are really an outgrowth of my experience in Silicon Valley, starting businesses, 21 businesses, uh, three nonprofits in my life so far. Startup Cup is my 21st business, and uh, maybe maybe my last. I don't know. We'll see. Um, so what I want to do, and how many of you here are thinking about submitting into uh, their business model into this uh, Startup Cup competition? Raise your hands. Okay. So the other ones, you're just interested in entrepreneurship and uh, what's what's required to start a business. Okay. Well, what I'm going to do is walk through. Uh, very quickly, well, I don't know, maybe 15 minutes. Um, how do you win the Silicon Valley Startup Cup? So the first thing is you got to go into the marketplace. You got to create revenue, and you have to create a viable business model. How you win Startup Cup is by building a sustainable uh, business or a business that has greater likelihood of being successful. Uh, it's one of the differences. It's built, built on theory. This is actually about starting a business. So if you're interested in starting a business or taking an existing startup you have to the next level, this competition is for you. The thing that you want to know is you don't need funding. You need revenue. So revenue is also funding. The key is how many people, how, what percentage of startups do you believe receive any type of funding, whether that's angel, VC or friends and family. What percentage of startups globally receive funding? 2% or less. So the way to get funding, if you don't have a track record of starting a business, is to create as much revenue, repeatable revenue is key, because then you're going to position yourself, if you are scalable, to, to, to be fundable. But revenue is the key, it's not about funding. The thing you want to do is leverage bootstrapping techniques. So before Silicon Valley became focused on fundraising, you used to have to bootstrap your business, create revenue, and build a business on your own. Those are the processes you're going to be using through the uh, Silicon Valley Startup Cup. And that means leveraging resources you have within your control, not focusing on things that are outside of your control. Everybody here has some kind of uh, resource or connectivity that they can leverage. But the coaches and the judges, part of Startup Cup, will help you understand how to leverage those resources and then connect you to new resources to help you accelerate your growth. This is the best description I've been able to find to describe what bootstrapping is. And I'll read this, although you're not supposed to type it PowerPoints, right? But this one's too good to pass up. Entrepreneurship is the process of creating or seizing an opportunity and pursuing it regardless of the resources currently controlled. So too many entrepreneurs say, well, I would start a business if I had more connectivity, if I had more funding, if I had more people on my team. Things that prevent them from starting a business are the things that are, that are out of their control. A real entrepreneur is going to move forward and start that business no matter what they currently have in their control. The other thing that's important is 
Instead of thinking about your startup and asking how much money uh, do I need, ask how little money do you need. You say you need $250,000, I'm gonna challenge you, can you do it for $1,000? Can you start generating revenue? Can you take your idea and develop a product or service and start selling it and generate revenue for $1,000 to move you forward, to position you for a larger potential investment or create enough revenue you don't even need an investment? What's the number one reason for startup failure? Any yeah, ideas? No team. Yeah, it's team, that's right. It's not finance, it's not lack of funding. 68% of startups fail because of dysfunction on the team, wrong people on the team, not building a team, doing it solo. Team is something that is critical and important if you're gonna be successful. And Startup Cup drives you towards building a team. And in fact, it's one of the areas that you're judged on is how well your team works together, how well they take action, and how coachable they are. Nothing of greatness happens without a team. Also, you want to be rapidly developing your product or service. That is, you want to, as quickly as possible, get it out of the marketplace. Even if you don't have a product or service developed, you can pre-sell it. So we're, we're pushing you to revenue as quickly as possible. Pre-selling is a way to fund production of your product or service. But rapid development means that many of you right now could be generating money tomorrow with the product or service you have. You just have to look at it differently and you have to overcome that fear of not selling. So, the other thing is you gotta sell to your customer right now. There are methodologies out there that are promoting interviewing hundreds of potential prospective customers. Instead, what you wanna do is you wanna focus on five, 10 target customers to sell to them. They're going to tell you the truth. They're gonna give you the information you need because when you're trying to take money out of their pocket, they're gonna give you honest feedback. And you might get a sale in the process. Our research is showing you have a greater odd of, odds of success by going forward and creating revenue as quickly as possible because then you're willing to power through the hard part of building a business. How long do you think it takes to go from an idea to scale to your first profitability? That could be $20 in profitability. What's that time frame? Any idea? The hard part. Five months is a good guess. A year is a good guess. 18 to 30 months to scale from an idea to profitability. Challenge is, that's hard work, it's transformational. You need to create revenue as quickly as possible because that's your reward. It gives you oxygen, it gives you the ability to keep persevering through the process of building a business, not just designing it, testing it, building it, the hard part. The other thing that's important is you need repeatable revenue. The best way to learn from customers is having repeat customers. Those customers are the ones who are telling you how to improve your product, what they like about your product, what they don't like about your product or service. Repeatable revenue is the single greatest way to learn how to evolve and listen to the marketplace to be able to develop and evolve your product rapidly and meet other potential customers. And then those customers who are buying your product or service over and over again, are referral-based potential. So they're gonna be able to refer you to additional customers. The one thing I'll say about this is that as a startup, you're not necessarily focused on profitability. You're focused on creating as much revenue as possible. You're focused on creating repeatable revenue. Profit comes down the road. So too many startups focus on profitability or too many advisors put too much emphasis on profitability when revenue is re being reinvested back in the business anyway. Profitability comes down the road, so focus on revenue, repeatable revenue. Uh, so stop talking, start doing, is another key component here. Say, so if you're not actually doing, and you're not going and talking and getting engaged and selling to customers, if you're not developing and evolving your product, if no one's telling you to get up in the morning and make that phone call, you have to do that on your own. What percentage of this room will actually take action related to advancing their business? This is on average, we see this within a room like this. What percentage of you will actually take action and do something? One to two percent? No, it's a little more than that. You're, you're, you're somewhere, you're interested in entrepreneurship, you're aspiring, you want to start a business. 35%, 35% 
still a fairly small number if you think about it, only 35% of you will actually take the steps to build a business, to start starting a business. Stop talking, start doing, too many excuses in the world. On your table you have uh, a framework, a visual, self-guided visual thinking tool that I designed uh, along with, there's a collection of his tools that you can download for free, startupcup.com. Uh, they create a framework for you to actually think through and design your business model. The great thing about the business model scorecard is it's designed specifically for startups. So it's specifically designed for startups with an extra emphasis on team development and action. It's a five-step process. I'm going to walk you through it. We're gonna, you're going to have a little bit of time here tonight to work on this uh, and go through the process. I'll show you some examples. Step one. Okay. Step one. What is your value proposition? How are you different? What pain are you overcoming? If you can overcome a pain, you can make money. If you can overcome a pain, you can make money. How are you different? This is a place where very few people are clear and are not, are, are not spending enough time identifying what is your true value and what's your differentiator because this is ultimately what you sell. This is ultimately what you sell. Step two is customer development. All four of these quadrants have to be working together efficiently and effectively to, to build a customer base, a strong customer base. So who is your target customer? Understanding that. Remember, I talked about when you go sell to a customer, it's identifying your top five, top ten, and selling to them. It's not just an interview. Sell your product or service. Pre-sell something you have. But not everyone is your customer, so you need to get as clear as possible who that potential customer is, and then go test it by selling to them. Why will they buy your offering? Why are they going to buy your offering? Because you're providing so much value, and if you overcome pain, what? You can make money. Product or service, what are you selling? You'll be surprised at how few people are able to clearly articulate what is the product or service that they're selling. Try to get as clear and concise as you can about what that product or service is, and then, well, let's be specific, so we got that covered. What's your market? Your market is different than the actual product you're selling. So your market is, so for instance, if you're selling, if you're producing a, um, a, uh, a, a swap, uh, a, um, what do I want to say here, a, um, a testing device for diabetes strip. That strip, you may say, well, my, my market is hospitals, right? Or the, or the medical industry, but the reality is, that, that is the bigger market, but within that, you've got the actual labs that are doing the test for diabetes, which becomes your target market. So your market is very large as the medical industry, but you're narrowing it down to who's gonna buy your strips. Your strips are gonna be bought by labs that are gonna be doing tests. You gotta focus on who's your customer. Labs are not as large as hospitals, and there are fewer of them, but getting focused on who they are becomes important. Is it a growing market, is it a stagnant market, or is it um, flat? Also, how are you going to reach your customers? What is your vehicle? How, what is that going to be? Is it, is it the internet? Is it a wholesale? Retail? How does your product or service get to the customer? Very important. What's that channel? And then, um, okay, so all, all four of those have to be working together. It's important to understand them, and it's also important to understand your target customer. I want to be really clear about that. Revenue development. So, how do you make money? How are you going to price your product or service? It becomes very important. But how do you really make money? We like to see multiple revenue streams as part of your revenue. Because what that means as a startup, if one revenue stream doesn't work, you're able to jump onto another revenue stream and test that for in terms of your ability to sell and make money. Plus, when you get into repeatable revenue with customers, those customers will show you where other potential revenue streams are based upon the feedback they're giving you or other products or services that they're gonna want. But how do you make money? How many revenue streams do you have? No matter what, you have expenses. So even if you have bootstrapped your way where you have no real out-of-pocket expenses, you yourself are not being paid, you've got other people working for you for no cost, 
You've got people you're bartering with for your legal advice, so you're, you know, you're able to really bootstrap and leverage all the connections you have. You still have expenses, and you still need to account for yourself as an expense, even if you're not getting paid. Your phone is an expense. Driving your car to meetings is an expense. Traveling is an expense. Focus on understanding what are your true expenses, even if you're not spending money, because that's gonna help you understand how much revenue you need to create um, to be sustainable and grow your business. And then you'll notice we don't have profitability on here again, but instead, because we have a bootstrapping methodology, what resources and what connections do you have that you can leverage, that you can bring in, and, and turn that into not spending money, but like cash, get people to do things for you or get other services at a, barter, at a bartering or at a reduced cost. So what resources do you have available? Very important. And then, as we said before, number one reason for startup failure is lack of team, dysfunction on the team, wrong people on the team, team challenges, same people on the team. So you want to, be, and there's, there's, there's three key players that you need on any startup to increase your odds of success. And those three people are the ID or visionary, the person who comes up with the ideas, the promoter and salesperson, and then a financial manager. The key thing here is you can only be great at one of them. That means you have to find two other people that are just as great at those two other things. Three key people on a startup will increase your odds of Success, yes. How do you find members? Excellent question. So how do you the question is how do you find members of your team? So many of you are very young in here. When I was your age starting a business, what I would do is find people like me with gray tops. And I would work networks to my family, friends, right? your family, places you worship, churches. All these places have community groups you're involved in. All these places have people that you can tap. So you already have a built-in network. You just have to look at people a little differently and start asking people for their help by engaging them in your business idea. So what I'm always doing is what kind of skills, what kind of talents do I need? This changes over time. But you need to be making lists. What kind of names, what kind, pardon me, what kind of skills, what kind of talents am I looking for? Make a list. So I'm always collecting people. If you take one thing from this entire presentation today and you don't do anything to start up a business, know for the rest of your life you need to be collecting people. That's how you're going to be successful, not just in business, but in life. <laughs> Critical. Collecting people. Then, how are you going to promote your product or service in your business? How are you going to get that message out there? You have limited time, limited resources, limited, a limited uh, team members, right? You've got to figure out ways to get your message out there. You saw Startup Cup, you saw our growth. Last year, 700% growth. Almost all of it is viral. It's organic, referral-based. People talking about what's happening with Startup Cup and then people signing up. That's the kind of place you want to try and get yourself to, where people are talking about what your product or service is. And then everybody in a startup is selling. So anybody and everybody who's part of your startup is selling. Everybody sells. Because when you sell, you can create revenue. And revenue is funding. You don't need funding, you need revenue. So everybody needs to be selling. How? It's not good enough to go have a conversation with somebody, have a great meeting, walk away from that meeting, wow, well, that was a great meeting, there's some real potential there. Close the deal. Anybody know ABC? Look it up on YouTube. ABC. Always be closing. Always be closing. It's a great video um, to watch. And then every, every startup does need funding of some kind, right? What do you have that you can sell? you can turn into cash. That's what you want to start looking at. Or the famous friends, family, and fools. But you need to focus on what you have and what you have in your own control that you can turn into cash that you can then leverage to fund your business forward because you're asking for how little money do I need to get myself into a place to start generating revenue instead of how much. Reverse it. Credit cards also work. Mm -hmm. Step five. This is where it gets hard. This is where that 35% statistic comes in. 
most people are not willing to take the steps or the actions to actually turn that idea or that business into a real career path, revenue to make a real business. And so what you see here are ways to look at how do I bootstrap, how do I get revenue, how do I get, how do I get some funding, what can I leverage, how do I develop a team. Everybody needs to be developing a team. If you have three visionaries and ideators on your team, you're going to fail. You're going to fail. You cannot have three ideators and visionaries. You will butt heads. You will fight. You will argue. You will be like the Beatles. You will break up. You've got to have a diversity of team. And then you've got to test those assumptions by going out and selling to your customer. Can you sell? Is the price the right price? Will they pay for this at this price? Will they buy it? and continually always evolving your product and service and growing revenue. So action, can't emphasize it enough, this is the place where so many entrepreneurs fall short. This is, this is an area that you will not advance in the Silicon Valley Startup Cup if you cannot show the judges that your ability to take action and create progress into the marketplace. There's gonna be a panel up here of past winners participants and that's one of the things that you're going to find them talking about is the progress that they were able to make and the, and the way that they were able to proactively engage the judges and coaches into into helping them advance their business forward okay here's an example of a wonderful business model scorecard this is a company called GoFig this is Pakistan this company just won the world startup cup in Armenia three weeks ago Amazing, out of all the startup cups, local startup cups, first place winners were eligible to compete. They just took it home. The one thing you'll notice that I want to highlight on here, see where it says the big idea, that's the value proposition, what makes you different, what pain are you overcoming? What that says right there, over to the left, cure terrorism. That's their value proposition. Cure terrorism. That's a heck of a value proposition, right? That is powerful stuff. And so the question becomes, how are you gonna cure terrorism? Well, they created a software platform that can predict where terrorist acts will take place and then come, have come up with a strategy to help reduce the, the fatality or impact or altogether stop the terrorist attack from happening. Amazing, it was an idea. They raised $1.5 million and they're setting up shop in North Carolina. But that was an idea right there. What you'll notice about that is, look at all the action up there. You see that action? All those post-it notes, those are all action steps. They put a tremendous amount of energy into what action steps do we need to take to make this company successful and create revenue. During the competition, the CIA started buying their product and service. They generated $250,000 in revenue during the competitive process by selling their software. So this is an example of a wonderful business model scorecard, and you'll see that everything has something filled in, but a tremendous amount of effort and energy was put into action. Go fig, amazing group. 70% of the team is our females. Amazing time. This is a this is a different, this is the same, this is a business model scorecard, it's in Arabic. We've got it translated into five languages right now. Um, this is an Arabic version. You'll see here again how much energy they put into filling out their value proposition, even using visuals. This is a company called Creato Tech out of uh, Alexandria, Egypt, and they, they do robotic training in schools. And so they put a lot of energy in their value proposition. One of the things you'll notice on this, though, that was missing is action. You see how the action? piece is missing, you want to put energy into what actions can you take. This is, this is just an interesting one, I, I thought, because it, it, uh, it showed how much energy they put in their value proposition. And then, here's a, here's a, here's a, here's a uh, business model scorecard, it's the last one I'm going to show, for a company that makes recycled bricks in Cairo, Egypt. And so, they're making recycled bricks, you'll see here that they put a lot of energy in the value proposition, and then they're clear and concise about their product. Recycled bricks, that's their product. It's that simple. Don't over try to complicate it, right? They're making recycled bricks. They now have raised over $2 million and they're manufacturing recycled bricks in, in Cairo, Egypt. Buildings are being utilized using their bricks. But this is, this is, this is a good example of a business model scorecard filled up 
in a positive way. So your job here is to remain open to different thinking, uh, look for solutions that increase your value. Always be looking for ways to increase your value. Search, search for ways to accelerate into the marketplace. You're going to be experimenting by selling to customers how you create revenue. The only way you're going to find that out is by selling to the customer. And then take action, build a team. So, how many, how many, how many, how many coaches? How many coaches are here besides the judges? I know we've got them up front here. Okay, we've got some here. Okay, what you're going to want to do, we're going to, we're going to have about 20 minutes here where we're going to be able to work with you on your business model scorecard and help you design your business. This is something you want to use for those who are thinking about submitting into the competition. You're going to want to use this as a baseline. The questions that are being asked are questions based off the scorecard here. I'm going to finish with this brief, brief outline of the competitive process so you understand what's going to be taking place. So first of all, I'm not going to go into this entire list. You can go to the website. The timeline's on the website. The number one thing to know is May 9th is the deadline for submitting your business model. That's the most important thing to know right now. Once that passes, you can't submit again this year. So May 9th is the deadline. It's eight easy questions. All of them built around the five-step process you see here with the um, business model scorecard. What you're rewarded for, this is important. You're rewarded for designing a solid business model, going to market and generating revenue. So if you really want to start a business that has increased odds of success and decreased odds of failure, this is an acceleration program for you. You want to engage and secure customers, you want to apply your bootstrapping techniques, you want to build a team, go for, you share this repetitive process of team. You want to be flexible, listening, and coachable. Coachability is actually something that you're going to be rated on by the judges, how coachable you are. Uncoachable entrepreneurs will not proceed through the competitive process because they're not absorbing, they're not listening to what's being said. They're not taking to heart and they're not applying those lessons. And then you gotta share your compelling business model story. This is how the judge is gonna decide a winner. To showcase an opportunity to develop a successful new business. 92%, so since 2007, 92% of the grand prize winners are still in operation and growing. That's because of this process. That's because those startups that come out of this competitive process are primed, have the resources, and have shown the greatest probability of success. You've identified a solution or overcoming a real customer pain because what happens when you overcome a customer pain? You can make money. Proactively and consistently showing progress. You want to be showing progress. And then selling to customers quickly and adapting to what's being lessened, learned. And then you want to showcase a revenue model that complements your business model. This will be something we'll go into more, that the judges and, and, and coaches will go into more, but the, business, the financial model has to work with your business model. So your business model is one thing, but your financial model has to bolt onto that, and that's how you ultimately get yourself to profitability, and then you have to showcase a coachable team. This is the one thing you have to understand. The Startup Cup here is open to any type of business idea. You're comparing apples to pomegranates, tangerines to pears. Startups are different, so you're going to have lots of different business models competing in this um, competition, which means it's art, not science. That's important to understand. The judges bring a different set of backgrounds. There are universals to start any, any business, but each business is going to be evaluated on the basic criteria that I outlined, but it is art, not science. Okay, are there any questions? Yes. Um, I mean, uh, I mean, I just wanted to make a talk about coaches. Like, What's the question? It's uh, the stop talks, stop talking stuff. Uh, you have a product development. So the question is about stop talking start doing rapid product development. How do you get that product into the marketplace, right? Or, or you, you, how do you take that idea and turn it into a product? Yeah, I mean, you 
Pacino, please. Okay, if you have a, a product that's perishable, so you want to do rapid production of it, yeah. then the next step you say, also oh, stop talking, start doing. But what if you need to be talking to people in order to get a perishable product into stores or into a store fronts to sell it? That makes sense. Okay, um, yeah, so stop talking and start doing is that you're going to go sell your perishable product as quickly as possible because you're going to lose money if it doesn't okay, sell. So you want to make it before. You want, you want, well, I'm not saying you want to make it before. What I would do is have samples. So I'm going to tell you a story about a company called Great, Great Granny's Bacon Drippings. Granny's Bacon Drippings. <laughs> true, true, true business. Came into Startup Cup, Tulsa Startup Cup, showed up with a box, an idea, Granny's Bacon Drippings. And the notion was that she was going to be able to sell bacon drippings into the marketplace and that you could make chocolate chip cookies with bacon drippings and that, you know, everybody, the only play you get bacon drippings if you put them into a jar and save them yourself. And, you know, have you ever seen those in people's covers and how gross that looks? It's a perishable item to some degree, right? So what she did is she put together and went to Tyson's took some of the waste that they had from the bacon that was being run off from the bacon, or the, the, the bacon they would cook in massive amounts, and started packaging it, and then started selling it in small quantities to a small grocery store. And so the small, and then what she did is every Saturday and Sunday, she did tastings with different foods she would make herself. Cookies, um, chocolate chip cookies, by the way, they're, they're okay. Um, and she proved that there was a market, and then she went to the next stage uh, grocery store and was able to start sh selling into those grocery stores. She actually created a new product category, is now selling at Walmart. So what I'm saying is you gotta, when you gotta, start, you gotta start small with a, with a store, a local store. So I think the way she started the one local store, the boutique store, I'm thinking about the one in Woodside right now. It's a little store, I forget what it's called, that you can go to, probably get into it, they'd be interested, you tell them your startup, and then they start selling your product, but do tastings and then have your product there so you're selling it yourself, proving to the store that you can actually move the product and then grow to the next tier, uh, tier stage. What is your product? It's, it's organic and people with body care and home care and okay. classes that you want to buy yeah. Okay, so focus is really important here and so figuring out what you want to sell. That's a, that's a more difficult market to penetrate, obviously, because there's a lot of that going on and a lot of people making their own organic, healthy um, body care products. That, that's why I want to also teach classes, because people are starting to be really interested in doing that. Yeah. And so te like focusing on, on going places and teaching classes for people how to do that, as well as offering a finished product, people don't want to always just make their own stuff. So there you go. You got, you got like a couple different business models there. What I would say, you want to engage some of the coaches and judges here and, and get their input on it. But I think that fundamentally, again, stop talking, start doing these, going and selling that and getting someone to buy it, or selling your, your educational background. Either way, you got to do that. Um, I'm going to move on so we can actually get something done here and actually have you have you start working on your business model report cards. And so let's get to work. How long do we have, Alice? Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go to the panel. Oh, right now? Yeah. Okay. Go oh, panel. we're going to go to the panel. Okay. How, how do we turn the time? Can you? It's on. <laughs> I'm not used to these microphones. Uh, we did want to have you work with your ideas on the business model scorecard, but what we thought, thought is that we'd go right into the panel for 15 minutes or so and hear what our entrepreneurs from our competition have experienced, and then you can get something to eat, and you can begin thinking through what you've heard tonight. How does that sound? Good. Okay, so I'd like to introduce to you uh, Nancy McCarrigan from Tangerine Flesh. She's our first place winner from the 2013 <laughs> And Nancy, you can go up on the stage, and then Vera Chadwick with Startup Para. She's one of our top seven for 2013. And Andy apparently was unable to make it tonight. So we'll have our two panelists, and we have two judges that are going to be asking them questions. Michael Bernard is here as one of our Startup Cup judges, as well as Jeff Cuddley. So,
Vedi? Well, this is going to be relatively informal, but um, we've asked some of these questions in the past and uh, had pretty good results. Um, the first question I think people want to know is things like, what, did, what was the most difficult part of competing and what did you learn from this process? Those types of questions. So why don't we start um, Good evening, everyone. My name is Farrah Chadwick, and I'm the CEO and founder of Startup Pair Up. And I just want to tell you a little bit about what we do before I answer the question. And uh, as a mom of two, I had a real difficult time re-entering the workforce. I had previously owned my own business where I trained engineers on software development tools. Fairly successful, got married, stopped my career to have a family. And when I tried to re-enter, it was really, really hard and I soon realized that I wasn't alone. So after a, uh, many attempts of resumes going into the black hole with no responses, I found an opportunity with the high profile startup uh, that allowed me to volunteer for a couple of uh, days a week. After a few months, they offered me an equity role to come join the company. Um, by then, I decided that I could either work for them or I could start something where I could help other women and businesses. Um, startups are often underfunded, uh, require a lot of talent, um, and there was a huge lack of, of uh, you know, uh, talent really. And we had lots and lots of women uh, who are looking for opportunity to re-enter smart, educated women who are looking for flexible jobs. And I thought that this could be a great opportunity uh, for a business. So we have a website that allows you to go and post your resumes and companies can go and post jobs. And once they are vetted, we uh, allow them to connect with each other. They can apply for jobs and so forth and network. So that's sort of the overall concept of Startup Hair Up. Um, as far as what was the hardest part, I think for me the hardest part was filling out those forms. Um, I, I don't know about you, but for me, it was every few every few months you had to fill out more forms that talk about okay, what's your market, what's your action, what did you learn, what did you gain, and so it was it was difficult because you really had to think about what was different and what advice did the coaches give you that you implemented and how did you implement and you really had to show proof, and it was great that you had to do that because it forced you to be focused. Um, as far as what was the, the best thing, oh my gosh, there were so many good things. The coaches are extremely helpful. Um, Alice is great in helping you connect and network. Um, I still maintain my connections with some of the coaches as well as Alice. It really helped me to define whether this is a viable business model. You can have lots of business ideas, and unless you put it down on paper and then actively start working on it, and I've been at it for a little over a year, we have lots of resumes, we're working with companies, building partnerships, we're, we've got startups and accelerators who know about us, and being part of this competition last year really made me sort of realize that it's okay for me to go out there and talk about it. It kind of made me feel um, like it's a real thing that I wasn't just go out there doing my own thing and hoping that somebody would help me and discover this and would agree that this was a good idea. It validated my business model. It helped me. It bought me some integrity. You know, people said, "Oh, okay, you were part of this competition, and you were uh, in the finalists." So it it really does provide you with some you know, integrity and validation. And that was really important for me for a mom who stopped working for a while. You know, you're dealing with issues of 
uh, self-esteem? Am I still viable? Is my experience still worthy? And what are my old skills? And what are my new skills? And how do I bridge this resume gap? So it was really, really important for me. I really enjoyed my experience. Sorry for the long answer. So I'm Nancy McCarrick from Tangerine Plus, and um, our company is a potential partner of <laughs> Arab Startup. Um, so we have a software product, we're in the renewable energy space, and basically what we do is we take the real-time production data from renewable energy systems, integrate them into a very engaging display that companies that are really concerned about the, the P and planet on their triple bottom line, you know, there's the people, there's, there's the profit, and there's the planet. Uh, gives them a vehicle to report in an accountable way to their stakeholders what they're actually doing to better the environment. Um, so it's a corporate responsibility product. And it, it's at the same time very artsy and engaging. And uh, my business partner is a designer, graphics designer. And so uh, it's a business that we knew. We've, I've worked in a renewable energy company for seven years prior to starting up a Tangerine Plus. And um, so we had an idea. I would say that coming into the startup cup competition, we had an idea and a prototype and thought that uh, that was probably enough to take the next step. And we found out that it wasn't. Uh, for me, for us, the hardest part um, was the presentations. How do we take all of the ideas that are rattling around and all the stories that we have to tell and all of the information that we want to convey and put it into an increasingly succinct package? Because every time you stand up to present, you have less time to present and more it is that you have to say. Uh, and so it was really a great process to go through the distillation uh, we had to think a lot, and it really helped us gel as a partnership to go through all of that and to begin to discover the places where I might have a different idea than my partner Jennifer had. And so we had to really you know, decide what does it mean to be on the same page. And, um, and then, you know, after doing that, and, and Michael is a, he's a keen stopwatch holder, he really holds you to the mark. Um, and, and then become, come the questions that, that come after that from the people that are, you know, from the, from the mentors and the coaches that are, that are listening to your presentation. And, and having to remember all of that in that stressful moment because there's valuable feedback there that they didn't want to go back and, and, you know, put into your thoughts and your actions and figuring out where you want to go next. What did we gain from it? Uh, we gained a lot. I will say sitting here tonight listening to Sean talk, I realized that um, we gained the opportunity of actually walking through that process. I approach life in a very organic fashion. I kind of experience it and I think about it and I tr try and figure out what logically takes me to the next step and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But you know what? We actually did all of this. We had a big idea and we had to think about who the product was and how we were going to get it out there. The revenue and the expenses, and by gosh, guess what? Because of Startup Cup, we were able to be one of 18 entrepreneurs that were accepted to Solar Power International, which is the big renewable energy show, free exhibit space for the full exhibition. And we are now doing a development project for one of the most, one of the biggest data monitoring commercial companies in the country. So this is like huge for us because of what we were able to do. We could not have won that competition to get that space if it had not been for what we had to go through to get as far as we got with the Startup Cup. And the team, absolutely key. What Sean said about networking, you know, my, my career goes back quite a few years. And I always, I, I say, I have the people I worked with that I keep with me, you know, the ones that, you know, you work with people wherever you are, the people that, you know, you're going to school with, the people you're working with, who are the ones you want to keep in your life? So when I needed to choose who was going to handle my finance, I remembered the CFO of the last company I'd been with. I trusted him and he knew the industry, right? Who did I want for surf architect? Oh, you know, there was that fellow that I met through a workshop that I took years ago and we, you know, and so I built my team and all the key people through the networking. Everyone on my immediate team of advisors are people that I knew in some, some phase of my life before. 
So going through this process has gotten us to where we are now. We're bringing in revenue. Um, we've maxed out, I personally have maxed out the credit cards. Um, but we have momentum and we have traction and we're really looking forward to moving to the next step. We anticipate that we will um, not have our own exhibit space but have shared space at the Intersolar Show in San Francisco that's happening in July. And um, I, I, I would say my, the last two weeks, I really believe that, that we've launched because I get up in the morning and I get to work. And, you know, last night I think it was 12 o'clock at night before I finished my last deliverable. But I feel like I'm actually doing what it is that I like to do and getting results from it. And Startup Cup, Jeff, Jeff was a great coach um, and is still a great coach for me. It's a relationship I would not have made if it hadn't been for the competition. So um, I actually don't see where anyone would have anything to lose by choosing to participate. Well, good evening. I'm Jeff Cattuli, uh, a.k.a. Cuddly, uh, <laughs> a.k.a. Cutely. Uh, I'll answer to uh, just about any, any name. Um, you know, one of the things about being an entrepreneur uh, or a student, uh, to be successful, you have to be intentional about what you do. So the question I have for our entrepreneurs here today is, reflecting back, what did you do intentionally? And tell us about the demons that you had to overcome in order to truly be intentional about the things, the actions, the priorities that you had to take in order to move your business idea out of the starting gate. That is a huge one. Um, it's hard for me to say that there was any major action that we've taken that hasn't been intentional. I would say the one piece that wasn't intentional was the planting of the initial seed. Um, because we got a phone call from a sales guy we used to work with that said, hey, you know, I have a customer and I, they want this product and we can't do it and can you help us out? And so that call came to Jennifer, and Jennifer called me, and she said, what do you think? And I said, well, let's see what's going to happen. And so we didn't get that particular deal, but what we got was an idea to build a company around. And I have to say, just about every step, what do we do next, right? So we didn't get the deal, but we got the relationship with this company that got us access to their data, that got us the ability to build a prototype, right? That prototype got us to think about what happens next. Meeting Alice was not intentional. <laughs> Alice sold me on entering the Startup Cup competition two days before the deadline, right? Um, but coming out of the sessions and saying, what do we do next was all intentional. Targeting our customers. We knew who the key customers were that we wanted to go after in terms of our channels. Um, what we're discovering more are more channels that are out there that we didn't know about. Well, which ones are we going to choose? So. I, I have to say I think that the process of building from that idea to, to where we are today and where we'll be in the future has been one that's been very measured and I, I, I just, I don't think we could have gotten there by luck. I don't think it's been a seat of the pants experience. Um, so that's, that's been my personal experience. So intentional for me we had to build a very good site um, a website that would allow people to come the, the candidates to come and post their resumes companies to come and post their jobs we had to build uh, an advisory team mentors partners and there was a lot to do and uh, I didn't have a partner I'm I'm the founder we do have a financial advisor, but he's really uh, also my husband. So <laughs> he has a full-time job, but I pull him in whenever I need uh, his help. Um, so I had to have a solid website that people could really use. And I, I, I my background is in you know social media and blogging and so forth. I feel like that's a, a career that that developed after I you know worked the industry already. Uh, so that was that was really hard. 
the demon for me would be, you know, proving the revenue model. I mean, you know, Jeff and I had several uh, discussions about that, and he was kind enough to have a one-on-one -on -one with me one day, spend over an hour talking to me, helping me, guiding me about how to present this, how to present it to the coach so that they believe, that you believe, that this is the real thing. Um, I would say the revenue model was, was a, a big one for me. And, uh, you know, we came up with, okay, training, this is my background, so if you want to be trained on how to get out there and, and uh, be able to uh, work again, if you want a one-on-one, -on -one, if, if, the, if a company then hires you, then there's a placement fee. If you don't want to have a full pl placement fee of a certain percentage, then would companies rather have an internship fee? So lots of, you know, thinking through ideas and, and asking companies, really. I mean, we can sit here and guess all we want as to what, 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 what are we going to do, but until you start talking to companies and say, what will you pay for this? It's not real. So those were some of the uh, issues that we had. How much time do we have left? I actually um, was hoping to maybe move on to the next day. Okay, I guess we're through then. Did you, did you have one more time? I, I, actually, I'd like Jeff to uh, sum up something we discussed earlier. I, well, I'm going to be kind of repeating myself because I think uh, our entrepreneurs did talk about uh, the importance of being intentional in whatever you do, whether you're a student or an entrepreneur. You have to prioritize. You have to stay focused. You have to challenge assumptions. Um, and quite honestly, you, you need mentors and coaches uh, in the same way that many of you probably uh, wrestle with your own inner demons about whether or not you should have a tutor to help you in, the, in language arts or math. Uh, invite criticism. And that's what we're doing. And I think that's what you're hearing here, is that with our entrepreneurs, they put themselves um, in the Silicon Valley startup cup, hung a target on their back, and came into our den. Uh, and I don't think we disappointed. Uh, they usually went out uh, somewhat frazzled, um, which for Michael and I, that was a sign of our success. Uh, so please, I'm going to move on to the next uh, uh, part of the evening. But please do come up to uh, Michael or myself and ask questions about the Startup Cup, about coaching, what to expect, and we'd be happy to answer any other questions. And we'll be happy to answer any questions you have, too. <laughs> can, I, can I just say one thing? Even if you're not serious about your business idea, this is a great program to challenge it, to test it, because you will, through this process, figure out if it's real, and you may really have a great idea, and if you don't, you'll come up with something new. And just through the process, you will learn so much. It's like an accelerated business program that no one else is offering. I loved it. Good luck. Thank you. So everybody, thank you so much for being here. My name is Heidi Diamond. I'm uh, the business division champion for entrepreneurship. And I so appreciate your attention to the Silicon Valley Startup Cup. And I encourage you to enter the Silicon Valley Startup Cup. We have that information on your program on how you can enter. And I very much thank Sean Griffin, Alice Fenton, our wonderful panelists who had a great experience going through this program. I would also like to tell you that West Valley College has a great program here in entrepreneurship. We have much information at the front table where you registered. Classes in Entrepreneurship, a State Certified Transferable Certificate in Entrepreneurship, and um, also a Transfer Business Degree. So you've been very patient. We would like to give you the opportunity to enjoy some food. And please stay while you're enjoying your food. Some of our mentors and coaches will be coming around and speaking with you. 
in addition, Daryl Collins and Jean McIntosh, could you please wave your hands? Um, Daryl is a former student and aspiring entrepreneur as well, and an amazing, a very talented interviewer. If you don't mind speaking with him, we'd like to get your impressions, hear about your passion, learn about the kinds of businesses you'd like to start, and whether or not you're going to enter the Startup Cup. So please um, try to stop by and talk to Daryl, talk to all of the great people who were here tonight. And we are delighted that you were here. We hope that you will uh, stay in touch with West Valley College and that you'll consider it your place to go for your entrepreneurial needs. Thank you, everyone. Please help yourself to food, come back to your table, we'll all be mingling with you.